Welcome to the easier way to sell presentation of Close the Deal Without Selling. Here's your host and developer of the easier way to sell, Ike Krieger. Hey, this is Ike Krieger. Welcome back. My goodness, we're at episode 40 already. This is very exciting to me, and I think you're going to love this episode. We'll continue with the chunking a little bit later in the program. And I have for you what I think is one of the most valuable tools that are available in our toolkit, and that is your spoken business introduction. Please pay attention to it when we get to that part. Take notes. If you have your action guide, follow along. But either way, that's a real good part. Plus, we're going to be revisiting echo listening, reflective listening, and we'll be discussing how you could use it in the rare time, in the rare situation where a form of an objection or a consideration does rear up its ugly head. But for right now, enjoy episode number 40. Open-ended questions help organize the problems for all involved parties and offers an opportunity to find a solution. When you ask the right question, you cause others to think more and think more clearly. How do you keep track of all the questions you're supposed to ask? You write them out in advance. And if you've been listening to these podcasts, you know that I urge you to go into your appointments with nothing more than a writing utensil and a blank sheet of paper folded in half in your pocket or your purse. You can use this sheet of paper to write down your notes during the appointment or prior to your appointment, you can jot down the open-ended questions that you want to use in your interview. On page 381 of the Action Guide, you'll find a version of an appointment worksheet that you can copy or alter to meet your own needs. But whether you use it as it is or change it, this is a functional example of the foldable piece of paper you take in with you. This is yet another reason this way to sell and market is easier. You get to take in your notes. What else can you do to prepare for your appointment? Well, they say repetition is the mother of learning. So we're going to go back over one of the sheets in the action guide, which is called Six Steps to OEQ Success. It's on page 182. For those of you without the guide, just listen along. That's all you need. Open-ended questions help organize the problem for all parties and offer an opportunity to find a solution. And when you ask the right question, you cause others to think more clearly. Here are the six steps to open-ended question success. First, you have to know your outcome and state it in the positive. Second, you need to learn as much as possible about your prospect. Third, you go through your list of open-ended questions in advance and choose the most appropriate questions for this specific prospect. Number four, actually listen to the answer. When you ask your questions, you must actually listen to the answer. Number five, probe further if necessary. This is an excellent opportunity to employ your chunking skills. And six, take action or respectfully withdraw. And remember, respectfully withdrawing is not easy, but go back and read what I wrote about problem clients. What this process all boils down to is a successful diagnostic interview, and that means open-ended questions. An interesting quirk of human communication and psychology is most people prefer talking to listening. And when you ask a question, you must give the person the opportunity to talk because the impulse to answer a question is automatic. The right question causes listeners to flow into a spontaneous response mode. Ask her a question, and she knows that she's expected to do more than just listen. And as James Thurber once said, it's better to know some of the questions than all of the answers. Okay, here's a pop quiz. 
I know, I know you didn't have time to study. We've been through exercises like this in past episodes, so let's do it. Okay, which is the best response and why? When meeting or talking to a prospect, in the first few moments you should A, talk about your company and try to make a good impression. B, ask questions to gain a strategic advantage. C, ask diagnostic open-ended questions and talk about yourself only when asked. Don't say too much and just try to complete the transaction. All right, now what's the answer to that? Well, the answer is C, ask diagnostic open-ended questions and talk about yourself only when asked. Next question. When someone requests your advice about a problem, you ask, A, where do you want to end up? B, what would happen if you do nothing? C, what have you tried? D, all of the above. I just love putting in all of the above questions, especially when they're the right answer. And for this one, it is all of the above. You respond with where do you want to end up? What would happen if you do nothing? What have you tried? And there are a bunch more questions you could ask. But remember, these are diagnostic questions like a doctor would ask. Next question. When dealing with a challenging or confrontational person or objection, do you A, Take offense and withdraw. B, get angry, yet do what they want. C, ask, what makes you think it's okay to talk to me like that? Or D, use echo listening to get them talking. Now, the correct answer is D. Now, yes, we've covered echo listening, but we really didn't discuss how to use echo listening to overcome objections or considerations. Now, although traditional objections disappear when you use this system, there may come a moment when a prospect has an honest response to your offering that might make you cringe. For instance, you use your presentation as your close and you demonstrate in every way how your product can solve their problem. And your prospect responds, you know, based on what you've shown me, your product seems expensive. Now, there are probably dozens of responses available to counter that objection or consideration. Your product seems expensive, but your natural inclination is to overcome the objection. And you may be very good at overcoming objections, yet your response may not address the real reason behind their comment. In this case, the easier and more effective way to get to the bottom of an objection or a consideration is through echo listening. When your prospect says, your product seems expensive, I suggest you respond by echoing their concern. Expensive? This is a perfect example of putting the ball into someone else's court. When you say expensive with a question mark, be it known that humans are programmed to answer. Let them answer. Let them respond. Let's go over a reflective echo listening exercise. And remember, your task is to listen as the other person communicates with you. Find a word or a brief phrase that interests you or a word or a brief phrase that pertains to the direction you believe the communication should go. You want them to come across the business minefield of their own accord and you want them to to explain why. Your job is to repeat back the words or the phrase and add a question mark. Example, I found the meeting productive, but a bit long. You're interested in engaging the value of the meeting, so you ask, productive? Your question implies that you would like more details, and the other person will in most cases elaborate on the productive aspects of the meeting. If it was your goal to find out why someone felt that the meeting was long, you could respond, long? Reflective or echo listening lets you funnel the communication in any direction you would like it to go. Few communications tools work as consistently or as effectively. So, my coaching, refine your echo listening skills.
good news. There are now two ways, count them, two, to get you, your colleagues, or your friends to the Close the Deal Without Selling website. Traditionally, of course, there is CloseTheDealWithoutSelling.com, and now the optional way to get there, and maybe a little easier to type, is SellAndMarketBetter.com. Oh, by the way, when you get to the website, pick yourself up a free preview of the Close the Deal Without Selling Action Guide. I think this is a good time to discuss first impressions in the world of sales and business, because as you've heard throughout your life, first impressions really do count. I heard not long ago that first impressions last. Well, how do you introduce yourself? That's the question. You hear about elevator pitches. You hear about networking openings. You hear about cold call openings. There are so many different ways that people introduce themselves that end up with people saying, no, thank you, or I'm not interested, that I decided to come up with a way for you to introduce yourself that will give you that same edge that using the system in sales gives you when you go out and sell and market. If you'll look in your action guide on page 333, that's 333, you'll see a cold call script. And at the end of the cold call script, it says, now go back to your, and there are two blanks. And those two blanks, when filled up, say problem statement. What is a problem statement and how does it fit with this conversation of introducing yourself? What do you say to somebody when you get on an elevator at the third floor and they ask you, so what do you do? What do you say to them by the time you get to the lobby that will have them respond in a way that you just might have some business in the future or you'll know that there is no chance of business in the future, but you'll both walk off that elevator with a smile. And that's what I want to talk to you about in this segment. As I mentioned before, how you introduce yourself is key, and you can make or break your personal marketing efforts in the first 20 seconds of your first contact with a new prospect. Most prospects make a decision about you and whether or not they're going to do business with you almost immediately. And you know this is true because you're as human as they are, and that's usually how you decide. You listen to someone, you take stock of what they say and how they're saying it, and you decide right then and there if what is being presented is of any importance to you or the people you care about. This is exactly the way people respond to you in the language that you use when you introduce yourself. Based on thousands of conversations I've had with professionals, with marketers, with networkers, with salespeople, with negotiators, with executives, etc., they've all walked away from a deal that didn't happen, wondering why, wondering what happened. It's also my experience that these same people are pretty good at what they do, but it frustrates the heck out of them when what they do doesn't work out the way they'd expected. What if it really is all about language? What if a simple shift in how you communicate your introduction can actually make a profound difference in your results? What you need is a quick and effective identifier. You need a well-formed spoken introduction. And here's what I say in my spoken introduction. You know how companies or individuals feel discouraged when their marketing or their sales efforts just aren't producing the results they'd expected? Well, I help them with that. What is the goal of your spoken business badge? The goal of your 10-second spoken business badge is to clearly communicate the problem you solve. You'll know that your spoken business badge is effective when people respond with one of the following. Well, how do you do that? Or, hmm, can you do that for me? We want people to respond to our spoken business badge in one of these ways because these kinds of responses provide immediate feedback. It's kind of like the old red light, green light game we played as kids. If they ask you any of these questions, they're giving you a green light to continue. 
However, there's another statement which would be just as welcome, and that is, well, not me, but I know someone who could really use your services. That statement is a precursor to a referral. But there's an obstacle standing in your way. When you give your spoken business badge, the real challenge is to avoid telling people what you do. Staying away from telling people what you do can be the most difficult part of this approach to introducing yourself. But listen up. Time for a coaching reminder. For the most part, nobody cares what you do. They just don't care. They really, really don't. And even though that sounds a bit harsh and may surprise you, it's true. Most people don't care about what you do or how you do it. All they really care about is what you can do for them or the people that they care about. Therefore, you must shift what you say when you have the opportunity to present yourself. The key to a powerful spoken business badge is telling people the type of problems that you solve, and this calls for a shift in what you say. Now, you have the old tradition, and this, I hope, starts a new tradition. But first, let's look at a traditional introduction, and here's what a financial planner might say. Hello, my name's Steve. I'm a financial planner, and I have a service that helps individuals make the right investment choices. I help them maximize their 401k opportunities and retirement options. Plus, I provide really good service. When you make a statement like this, you're not setting yourself apart from your competition. You sound just like your competition. As a matter of fact, you've just placed yourself in a box with every other financial planner who introduces him or herself in pretty much the same way. This type of introduction does not make you memorable. This type of introduction does not even make you interesting. Now you have a chance to increase the impact of your spoken business introduction, and you'll do that by communicating your business in in an entirely different way. You're going to change one of your long-standing communications habits, and as we know, habits of any kind can be tough to change, but I'll try to make it easier. Instead of talking about what you do and how you do it, you're going to communicate the problem that you solve. And this is probably a shift in a way that you present yourself. In the early stages of your transformation from a doer to a problem solver, it may feel like a very large shift, but stay strong, stay focused, and stay committed because it's worth it. Now, here's the formula. Let's go over the creation of a spoken business badge. The first part is made up of a problem statement, and the second part is your emotional hook. Think of it like a formula. A problem statement plus an emotional hook equals spoken business badge. The problem you solve is the key. You wouldn't have gone into the business you're in if you didn't already believe that your product or service provided a solution for some problem or another. Now, your job right now is to write down a minimum of a couple of problems, three problems, that might be solved by your services. But first, let's go right ahead and identify the problem that's solved by three different professions. First, let's take a look at computer service. If you provide computer service, what problems do you solve? Well, here's one that comes to mind immediately. People spend a lot of money on their computers and they break. Or if you're an office manager, People in different departments don't have access to the same updated information. Now, I'm not in the computer service business, and I made up that problem while I was writing. However, I have a business, and I own computers, and I know these types of issues make me crazy. Let's see how this concept applies to the insurance business. What are the problems that the prospects of an insurance salesperson actually experiences? For life insurance, that problem might be... The death of a breadwinner will force a dramatic change in their lifestyle. Health insurance deals with a different set of problems. One would be an illness or an injury that will end up making the family go broke. And what about doors and windows? Well, they're too hot in the summer and they're too cold in the winter. And here's a problem that my clients face because they have to sell for a living. They're frustrated and stressed out. 
Now, to get the most out of your spoken business introduction, it's vital to clearly identify the problem that your target market is facing. Jot down a minimum of three problems that your ideal client most likely encounters. Well, let's go back to computer repair. Computers don't last long enough without breaking. Or let's look at the office manager where the computers don't connect between departments. Or the insurance company where they're dealing with the loss of income for a breadwinner. Keep going until you have three of these and be specific because this is what you need. To get the most out of your spoken business introduction, it's vital to clearly identify the problems that your target market is facing. And remember, the computer repair person is dealing with the problem that the computers don't last long enough without breaking. The office manager is dealing with computers that don't connect to the individual departments. And an insurance salesperson who's dealing with people who uh, lose the income from a breadwinner. Now, keep going until you have at least three problems that you solve and be specific. I'm going to save the rest of the spoken business introduction conversation until a little later in the episode. But right now, I want to get back to one of our favorite tools. Of course, I'm talking about chunking and I left it hanging. So let's reel it back in. Okay, let's talk about chunking again, and especially about chunking in your sales conversations. Let's just review for a second. You want to chunk down when you want to find out more specific types of a certain issue or product. You want to chunk out or sideways when you ask yourself what products or services are parallel to yours. And finally, you want to chunk up and ask what is your service an example of? of and generalize it. Now, during the diagnostic process, you ask the prospect to share with you what she's looking for in the product. And the response is, well, we need greater efficiency. Now, before we proceed, you've read all the sales books and they mostly tell you to provide information or visuals to your prospect as a way to convince an influence. Here's another heavy question. How does your giving this type of information transform your interaction with your prospect and the world? How does this increase their desire to buy from you? And what are the examples that made you believe that? What is dependent upon your effectiveness and on what is your effectiveness dependent upon? What are examples of this that made you believe this is so? Now, with these types of questions, we just chunked up. Your communications goal is to move the conversation to a variety of logical levels. And you might ask, when you think about doing X, what do you focus on? Now, that's a great question. And you have to ask yourself, where does that take your listener? The question you have to ask yourself is, do you want to move up to greater generality or do you want to move down to greater specificity? My coaching is that you move up to greater generality so that you can work your way down more effectively. And if the prospect says they need greater efficiency, you can ask them, well, how do you see a product like ours causing greater efficiency? Or what products have you looked at that provided greater efficiency? And then upon their answer, you move down to the specific. What features did that product have that had you believe it was more efficient? Now, let's finish off this segment thinking about the value of chunking. With chunking, you end up receiving the highest quality information upon which you can make your best decisions. You can then plan your tactics accordingly. Remember, highly functional systems and people who prefer highly functional tasks are constantly inquiring and constantly looking at a multiple number of logical levels. This ability to move up and down and through these logical levels is worth developing and strengthening. You can chunk up, you can chunk down, you can chunk sideways, but you're moving through multiple levels of a related topic, just like in outlining. One of the five ingredients of the YES formula is CAN, which stands for Curious, Authentic, and Neutral. 
And your curiosity helps you move the focus of your conversation from one level to the next. And this helps you harvest the most valuable information available. I read this statement while doing some research, and I think it's sadly important. Dysfunctional and self-limiting people and dysfunctional self-limiting systems tend to be locked in on a very small vertical area. That area may include only one logical level, and that means that there's very little inquiry and no search for specificity beyond that level. Remaining in and adjacent to only one level and not going any deeper or any higher in your thought process brings a word to mind, at least to my mind, and that word is shallow. Now, shallow may have other meanings, but we'll assign our own meaning for this conversation. Shallow occurs as a lack of desire to learn the facts. There's a resistance to new ideas. The consideration of beliefs outside of a narrow personal code are considered worthless and wrong-headed. Those who allow this lack of curiosity and lack of openness might as well wear an identity name badge so we might save our breath. Now, let's go back to something a little lighter, and that is chunking too many details can be counterproductive. Trainer Tony Robbins tells a very funny story about him asking a lady why she isn't exercising regularly. She says, well, I don't have enough time. And he said, well, if you did have enough time, describe for me what you would do when you exercise. She went into great detail about her mental outline of the project. She related the trouble she'd encounter finding a place to exercise. She voiced her concern about showering in a public area. She was conjuring up the horrors of not knowing what exercise station to use. Chunking down to all those details threw a mental spotlight on her idea of exercising. What she envisioned was negative and demotivating. In a situation like this, you could ask the question, before we discuss how you'll exercise, can you give me an example of how some kind of exercise would be a benefit to you? You just chunked up. If she says, well, I know exercise would be good, but I just don't want to go to the gym. I don't like it there. Chunk sideways. Ask, what other forms of exercise might you enjoy? Give me an example. The answer might be swimming, and then chunk back down again. Describe what you would do when you exercise by swimming. Or you could ask, in the past, what forms of exercise have caused you to feel the best about yourself? Or what form of exercise might you be able to do in the limited amount of time you have? These types of questions move up into the general. Diagnostic chunking is very powerful stuff. But learning to chunk effectively is another 100 pianos conversation. Practice. Change is never a matter of ability or time or resources. Change is determined by vision, motivation, and drive. Now, you can grease the wheels of this motivation and drive by asking the right open-ended questions when you chunk. You ask... How would you do X? What's involved in you doing X? When you think about X on what do you focus? Describe for me the whole process of you doing X. And once you elicit a general area, chunk down for specificity. But you need to have patience. Chunk slowly and steadily. Tony Robbins asks, how do you eat an elephant? The answer, you eat an elephant one bite at a time. Chunk too many details when you think about what you want to focus on, and you'll experience mental indigestion. If you have any questions, please contact me either on our Facebook page, Close the Deal Without Selling, or our LinkedIn page. Now listen up carefully so you'll get this close the deal without selling. <laughs> Please feel free to write and ask me any questions. Okay, let's talk about emotional hooks. An emotional hook may seem 
a bit sinister until it's clearly defined. And you can see a list of emotional hooks on page 327 of the Action Guide. And I've made mention of this emotional hook in the past and have told you that it is an important part of the formula. But an emotional hook can be any sight, sound, physical sensation, smell, taste, or experience that opens up a gateway to a specific memory. This memory results in an emotion or a set of emotions. In the study of Neuro Linguistics Programming, NLP, this emotional hook is referred to as an anchor. A great example of an anchor is when you hear a song that makes you think of a person, a time, or an event from your past. In many cases, these memories are positive, but in some cases, they are not. There are certain anchors that make you feel negative. A negative anchor might be produced by the memory of an experience called stuck in traffic on a crowded freeway. What emotion does the thought or memory of being stuck on a freeway conjure up? This negative anchor stirs up what type of emotions, and are these emotions positive or negative? What are some of the emotions that you associate with being stuck in traffic on a crowded freeway? Let's add another layer to this. What are some of the emotions that you might experience when stuck in traffic on a crowded freeway knowing that you're going to be late for an appointment. And that brings us to the control factor. Humans like to be in control, and when we're not in control, the adrenaline in our nervous system produces certain emotional sensations. And let's say for a moment that when you're stuck on the freeway, you're out of control. Maybe you don't go ballistic, and maybe you don't go crazy, but you'll have to admit that some people do. And this freeway analogy makes emotional hooks easier to remember. I've labeled these emotional hooks as freeway terms. Let's put this back into the spoken business introduction. A CPA helps people who feel they have limited control or no control at all over their business record keeping and tax preparation. So what is the job of a CPA? I believe the job of a CPA is to reduce the frustration and the struggle that are associated with record keeping and tax preparation. When the CPA reduces the frustration and the struggle of record keeping and tax preparation, some degree of control has been returned to the client. Reducing frustration and struggle is not what a CPA does as a process. What a CPA does as a process is record keeping and tax preparation. Reducing frustration and struggle and thereby returning some degree of control to the client is what a CPA does as a problem solver. Your spoken business introduction needs to include what you do as a problem solver and freeway terms help heighten the value of your problem solving abilities. As an effective communicator, your spoken business introduction must include these freeway terms in your problem statements. Here's a problem statement that includes an emotional hook or freeway term. And we'll again use the example of a CPA in the freeway term, overwhelm. The CPA would say, I help companies who get overwhelmed with having to stay on top of all of the regulations, record keeping, and corporate tax preparation. Notice the impact created by the word overwhelmed. And if you haven't noticed the impact, here's a little exercise. Say the above sentence out loud and leave out the words who are overwhelmed with having to. I help companies with having to stay on top of all the regulations, record keeping and corporate tax preparation. Just doesn't have the same impact, does it? So, each of your problem statements must include an emotional hook, and that's what we refer to as a freeway term for them to be truly effective. And this component of your spoken business introduction will help your contact create an emotional anchor connection between the problem you solve and your solution. You see, this emotional hook primes the problem-solving pump. Here are some problem statements with the freeway terms left blank. Listen to these and fill in that blank with an emotional hook, which will subsequently increase the impact of the statement. I help companies that are X with productivity issues. I work with families who are X 
that they may not have enough money to send their kids to college. My clients are X about the high cost of remodeling. Most people are X by the quality of education. We help people who are X because they're paying too much for their car's upkeep. So, you got to remember, include your emotional hook slash freeway term in your problem statement. I promise you this works, but once again, here comes the bad word. You have to practice. Well, that does it for episode 40. It's hard to believe that it's been a year since the first episode came out, and I couldn't be any more delighted about the response that I've been getting from you. Remember, contact me if you have any questions. I know that there's a lot of information coming your way, and I know you have a lot to do in your life. But if you'd like to live that life a little less stressfully, a little more happily, and a little more easily, I guess that's the way I would put it, take the time to learn how to communicate this way. Yes, it's about sales, but really it's about effective communication. And nothing would make me happier than you contacting me and telling me, yeah, I use some of your stuff to really make a difference in something I was doing. It's good stuff. This is Ike Krieger. See you next time.